I'm James Mina, Director of Opera Carolina, and welcome to this edition of Overtures, a preview to Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, or The Magic Flute. This opera was very special to Mozart. It was written more than 200 years ago and received its premiere on September 30th, 1791 at the Freihaus Theater in Vienna. Now, the Freihaus was the people's opera, as opposed to the Imperial Court Theater where grand Italian opera was always performed. In fact, an opera written in German with spoken dialogue, a Zingspiel, or a song play, which Die Zauberflöte is, was quite unusual for this time, and it would pave the way for the 19th century's very popular operettas. Now, the Freihaus was owned by Emanuel Schikaneder, Mozart's friend and the librettist for Die Zauberflöte, and Schikaneder performed the character of Papageno at the premiere. The premiere was a great success, and the Zauberflöte would go on to have more than 100 performances in Vienna alone. But Mozart would never experience this great success, for he died in December of that same year at the age of 35. Despite its universal recognition as a masterpiece among masterpieces, people often walk away from a performance of the Magic Flute or Die Zauberflöte thinking what a jumbled, nonsensical story this is. Great music, indeed, but what is going on in this story? Well, I hope this preview helps enhance your experience with this truly great work. The Magic Flute is an allegorical tale, not a fairy tale as it's sometimes called. An allegorical tale will use symbols to express universal human truths that hopefully are revealed to the audience. Now, the overarching theme of the Magic Flute is that harmony in human society can only be achieved through the perfect union of man and woman, and that this harmony, this union, is characterized by true and powerful love, purity of spirit, and by accepting the rights of Freemasonry. Mozart and Schikaneder were both Freemasons, as were many of the founding fathers of the United States and many of the leading thinkers of Europe in the 18th and 19th century. Now, both men and women could belong to Masonic lodges. Independent female and male lodges existed, particularly in Germany and France. Freemasonry was considered a subversive movement. It was aligned to the thinking of the Enlightenment, which professed equality between the common man and the nobility. And as such, it was suppressed by the Vatican and the nobility, particularly the Habsburg Empress Maria Theresia. And so it's fun to muse that perhaps the character of the Queen of the Night is a symbolic representation of the Empress Maria Theresia herself, and that perhaps the character of Sarastro, the High Priest of the Temple of Wisdom, rather than being the embodiment of the wizard Zoroaster, is instead a symbolic representation of the leading figure of Freemasonry in the 18th century, Ignaz von Born. The setting of the opera is two kingdoms, polar opposites, if you will. The Kingdom of the Night, represented by the moon, the color silver, and reigned over by the Queen of the Night, and the Kingdom of the Temple of Wisdom, represented by the sun, the color gold, and led by the High Priest of the Temple of Wisdom, Sarastro. When we first meet our hero, Prince Tamino, and it's very important that he's a prince because he represents the very nobility that suppressed Freemasonry, he is running away from a serpent which represents his ignorance and fear of the Masonic Order. He is then lied to by the Queen of the Night and sent off to rescue her daughter, Pamina, from the evil wizard, Sarastro. The rest of the opera is occupied by Prince Tamino and Princess Pamina finding that purity of love and equality through the Masonic rites. They must endure the Masonic rite of self-discipline through silence. And once they've accomplished this, they receive purification through the fundamental elements of fire and water. Having successfully endured these trials, the High Priest Sarastro gives them the mighty shield of the sun that they may be benevolent and wise rulers, together. And why a magic flute? Mozart tells us throughout the opera that music has the power to transcend human fear and hatred. So the moral of the story is that through the Masonic order and with the power of music, society is enlightened 
men and women equally. But why not just come out and say that? Well, remember, during the time of Mozart, the Masonic Order was suppressed, considered to be subversive, was under a papal bull of condemnation. So it was not only unfashionable to be a Freemason, it was also dangerous. You'll notice I haven't even mentioned Papageno. This beloved comic character is our everyman, not the high-minded nobility, but the common man. He too will undergo trials, but will fail miserably. But in the end, the benevolent gods grant him his perfect match, Papagena. Papageno's antics and the delightful music of the magic flute make it the perfect opera for young people. And yet, behind the fun and the beauty of the magic flute is this wonderful story, this allegorical tale of the Enlightenment about equality and pure love achieved through the Masonic Order. And as I said at the beginning of this Overture's preview, this was a special opera for Mozart, perhaps because he was a Freemason and believed so deeply in the Enlightenment. So much so that on his deathbed he thought of the performance of the Zauberflöte that was happening that evening, and he murmured, at this moment, the Queen of the Night enters the stage. Thank you for joining me for this edition of Overtures. I look forward to seeing you in the audience for all of our performances at Opera Carolina. Don't forget to visit us on operacarolina.org and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.